All right, welcome everyone. My name is Prez, and in this installment of the DCS F-14B Tomcat for Dummies, we'll be going over the Tomcat's famous AUG-9 radar. This section of the series will be broken up over a couple of chapters. This chapter, Chapter 3, uh, will be solely over understanding how the AUG-9 works, what all the radar modes mean, their strengths and weaknesses, and how to read the symbols presented to you on the TID. The following chapter, Chapter 4, will be for people wanting to learn the Rio seat. That chapter will be significantly more detailed, so stay tuned for that if you're interested. However, if you're just getting into the Tomcat or are more concerned with just being a pilot, then sit back and you'll be learning all you need to know about the AUG-9 radar. First off, let's talk about the two ways the AUG-9 transmits and receives radar information. Pulse Doppler Search and Pulse Search Modes. The first and primary method the AUG-9 uses is called Pulse Doppler Mode. This is the most common method of search and track that radars use to acquire accurate and stable data for radar contacts. In the Tomcat, Pulse Doppler will allow you to see radar contacts at ranges of up to 120 miles or more uh, and has the longest range of any search mode. Now, I'm sorry for this next section because I'm going to have to give a little physics lecture, but hold on tight because this information is vital in order for you to understand the pros and cons of the radar modes so you don't get mad when you think someone just disappears off your screen. Now, the way Pulse Doppler works is by using the namesake effect, the Doppler effect. If you've ever been walking alongside the road and a car passes by, and as it gets closer, the noise of the car gets higher in pitch, and as it passes you and speeds away, it starts to drop in pitch, then you'll know what the Doppler effect is. The way this works in the Tomcat is, when the radar is on, it sends out a pulse of radio waves, and then receives what you would call an echo. So you can calculate the closure rate of an object depending on the way those waves return. Think of the waves as a spring, and the frequency of the waves is the coil in the spring. We measure closure rates by measuring the difference in the outgoing and incoming frequencies. So if we have our Tomcat flying around and there is another aircraft in front of us flying the same speed at our same heading, there is no change in the returning wave. However, if an aircraft were flying towards us, you can see that the spring shrinks and therefore there is a measurable change in frequency, and so that radar return would be seen. The same is true for a target flying away from us at a greater speed than our aircraft, except the spring expands, and that would be a measurable change in the frequency of the waves. Now, you may be wondering, do I really need all this information to learn the radar? And my answer to that is yes. This information is invaluable as you need it to understand this next concept, the notch. Remember how I said a target flying your same speed and heading would not give a radar return? The same thing can be replicated with the use of a notch. What a notch is, is when a target out in front of you enters a near or perfect perpendicular flight path to your aircraft. The closer to 90 degrees they are, the better. And you may be thinking, well, why would that work? They're still moving sideways from me, right? Yes, they are. However, the radar's computer has a special system in them to filter out ground returns by doing calculations based on your relative ground speed. This is called the zero Doppler filter, which is somewhere around positive or negative 100 knots of closure. So the notch effectively makes a target blend in with the ground as they have eliminated their closure to you. Now, this does sound like a big issue for radars, and it is, but the very special thing about the F-14's radar is that you can actually circumvent this problem in certain situations. I'll be talking about that in my AUG-9 Rio chapter. So now that you know all about the science and junk, you should have a grasp on what the weaknesses of pulse Doppler mode are in the Tomcat. Now, it's time we talk about pulse mode in the Tomcat. Take everything you know about pulse Doppler mode except remove the fact that the computer filters out ground returns and you have pulse mode. Pulse mode effectively eliminates the ability for people to notch your radar as they will no longer be filtered out. And you must be thinking, wow, that sounds powerful. Why don't all radars just use that? And that's a very good question to ask. The answer to that is that uh, in a look down situation where a target is located below your aircraft, were they low enough to where the radar emissions also hit the ground below them, then they would disappear among all the ground clutter. This was always a big problem for early radar, which is why Pulse Doppler was developed and utilized, as you can still see a target outside the notch filter even if they are against the ground. However, there are ways to circumnavigate even this problem as we will discuss in my Rio chapter. Now that all that is out of the way, we can talk about the two main modes you will be using to see contacts on your TID.
The first is Range Wall Search, or RWS, which will display radar contacts on the TID. Range Wall Search can display up to 48 concurrent tracks on the TID and, as the name would imply, actually display them on the TID based on the target range from your aircraft. RWS will also display the target's altitude. Range Wall Search is great for when trying to find targets over a large area, however, RWS does not display target vectors. That is something the Rio has to determine via the DDD display uh, in the Rio seat. It's important to know that you cannot launch any missiles in this search mode. It is purely for finding and ranging targets. The last thing to note is that the Rio cannot hook up a target on the TID display uh, to display that target's individual track file on the TID. Now, let's talk about track wall scan or TWS. This will be the primary mode you use to engage targets with AIM-54 Phoenix missiles. This mode operates similarly to range wall search, however, the differences with this mode are that TWS can only track up to 24 concurrent targets at a time, the Rio can hook up a target to display their track file, and most importantly, it displays the target's relative vector. You must think, wow, this is the best possible mode, why not only use this one? And the answer to that is TWS, while it does display the most information, it also is limited to only two sizes of scan, wide and short or narrow and tall. Wide and short is a 40 degree two bar search and narrow and tall is a 20 degree four bar search. TWS is really only effective when actually engaging targets. One last thing, Unlike in other NATO aircraft where you have to slew the cursor over a target to lock them up for TWS and build the track file, the AUG-9 will automatically build track files and assign an engagement order number in descending order of closest target. So here's the TLDR to make sure you remember the most important points. 1. Pulse Doppler search mode has the longest range and is defeated by a target entering the notch filter. You can only fire on targets in single target track. Two. Pulse search mode can find a target in the notch, but is bad in look down situations. You can only fire on targets in single target track. 3. Range wall search will display targets on the TID and display their range and altitude. You cannot engage targets in RWS. Number 4. TWS will display target data and their relative vectors on the TID as well as allow you to engage multiple targets at the same time. The scan zone is limited to only two scan sizes. Number five, RWS and TWS both use pulse Doppler search. Finally, number six, the notch filter is somewhere around plus or minus 100 knots of closure. Finally, let's learn about the TID symbology. It doesn't help to know all this stuff about the radar and not know how to read the actual radar screen, right? So first things first, how do I tell what is friendly and what is hostile? Well, if you're coming from the Hornet, you'll be familiar with these symbols. But for everyone else here, there are three radar contact symbols you'll be seeing. All of these symbols will have a dot in the center. The first looks like a square cut down the center. This denotes an unknown friend or foe contact. The next looks like a diamond cut down the middle. This denotes a hostile contact. The final one is a half circle. This denotes a friendly radar contact. Simple, right? Now, when looking at the TID and scanning for radar contacts, you'll notice that you'll see these half symbols on the bottom half of the dot or on the top half of the dot. A symbol appearing on the top half represents a contact that is being tracked by your radar. A contact with the symbol on the bottom half represents a data link contact. You can also have these symbols appear with each other together as a radar contact and a data link contact. Usually if the data link you're using has IFF capabilities, the data link contact will automatically be IFF'd and displayed the correct symbol. However, the IFF in the Tomcat is a manual process that the Rio will have to do to the radar contacts. We'll talk about how to do that in the Rio video. Also to note, the three numbers on the left hand side are as follows. The top and bottom numbers show the highest and lowest altitudes in thousands of feet that the radar is scanning at the current TID view range. The center number is the elevation angle of the radar itself to let you know just how far up or down the radar is currently pointing. This helps the Rio more than the pilot, but it's still good to know. Also, when locking a target in SCT or hooking it in TWS, the closure rate in knots will appear on the right hand side of the TID with a positive or negative symbol beside it. The three digit numbers on the bottom left and on the right just under the closure rate are not important. Those are simply to tell you the computer is functioning. 
Now, direct your attention to the top of the TID. When a target is hooked up in TWS or locked in STT, the target's track data will be displayed here, cycling back and forth between two sets of two pieces of information. The first will display the target's range in nautical miles and relative bearing from the nose of the aircraft to the target. It's important to understand that this is not the absolute heading to the target. You will need to do a simple bit of addition or subtraction using your aircraft's absolute heading and the relative bearing of the target from your nose to get to the absolute heading of the target. The second set of information displayed will show you the target's current exact altitude and the target's magnetic course heading. This information effectively allows the Rio to be a personal GCI in the back seat. Also, when in TWS mode, you will notice an X appear on the TID somewhere in the center of all the radar contacts. This is a geometric center calculated by the radar's computer. The computer in TWS will automatically try to keep the radar pointed at the geometric center. There will also be a square that pops up in the center of the TID. That is a steering cue for the pilot to follow. One last thing. Radar contacts that drop off the radar will have an X displayed over them to let you know you've lost their radar returns. Now, here's the next bit of important information. You see the dashed lines coming from the center circle on your TID? Those dashed lines represent the scan cone of your radar from a top-down perspective of the battlefield. This can help you a lot with visualizing the gimbal limits and scan limits of your radar. The dashed lines are range indicators. Each dashed line is equivalent to 20 nautical miles. Each empty space is also equivalent to 20 nautical miles. This helps with approximating the range of the contact without having to hook it up on the display to display its individual track data. It's important to note that when looking at the TID, there is an imaginary curve line going from one dashed line to the other. It is not a straight line across, so keep that in mind when approximating ranges. The final bit of information you need for the TID is when using RWS or TWS. A single digit number will be displayed on the left hand side of the contact. This number starts at zero and goes up. This number represents an approximate altitude for the radar contact rounded to the nearest 10,000 feet. So zero would represent a contact between zero and 5,000 feet. A one would represent a contact between 5,000 and 15,000 feet. A two would be between 15 and 25,000 feet and so on and so forth. You may be saying, wow, that's not very accurate at all. And that's correct. However, it doesn't really need to be. It really just helps with getting the Rio to point the radar in the right spot and to have a simple to understand amount of situational awareness. Plus with enough practice, you'll be able to easily tell what a bandit's altitude may be regardless of the rough altitude estimate on the TID. The next piece of info will be when you are in TWS mode, you'll be able to see a number pop up on the right hand side of the radar contact. This number starts at one and will count up on each successive target that pops up on your radar. This number indicates your TWS engagement order. You can have up to six contacts set up for engagement at one time, depending on the amount of Phoenix missiles you have on board. Now, when you actually fire a Phoenix missile at the target in TWS mode, that engagement order number will be replaced by a countdown timer. That is a relative time till impact or TTI. I will be going over this aspect in more detail in the Tomcat combat tutorial. All right. Now you should know everything you need to know about the Tomcat's AUG-9 radar and reading the TID for air-to-air -air engagements. If you have any questions, feel free to ask in the comments and I'll be sure to answer them. However, if you would prefer to speak to me directly or even have me teach you in real time, consider joining the Alamo Squadron. I am the dedicated Tomcat instructor there and we have tons and tons of valuable information there to make you the best you could possibly be in DCS. The link will be in the description. If you enjoyed the video, a like is very much appreciated, leave a comment if you'd like, share the video with your friends, and subscribe if you want to see more content from me. Other than that, I want to thank you all for watching, and have a nice day.